Elizabeth left the den of wolves called Rebellion and headed for the north. Now in the kingdom of Amalilith, she continues to experience warmth like never before. Even if their marriage was not based on love, there was trust and care. On the day of the wedding, Eliza headed for the royal palace that was to be the venue for their high profile wedding. Being in another kingdom's royal palace made her unsettled for a moment before she recalled her conversation with Ren the night before. His assurance calmed her down by a lot. She wasn't alone. She walks into the changing room and was met an overly excited set of helpers. They were on a mission to turn her into the most beautiful bride ever and they took that mission as seriously as their lives. They said their battle with all soldiers of grace and beauty, giving it their all for the sake of victory. And then at last they were done. It had been a true battle but they had emerged victorious. She was ready and she looked beautiful. Their hard work had paid off and they looked at the artwork before them with longing satisfaction. Meanwhile, Ren had just finished getting ready looking like a speck but Eliza wins in my eyes and he headed for the wedding hall. He asked Luan how his bride was doing and was told she had appeared nervous in the beginning but her gracefulness most likely made it invisible to anyone else. It was his bride they complimented but it's him that smiled like a buffoon yeah. Luan sincerely congratulated Ren on his marriage before he headed into the hall, walking straight to the altar to await his bride. Not long after, she walked in, bouquet in hand, the smile from the heavens. Lucky you. His eyes still trained on her, he offered his hand to her and she graciously took it. They swore their vows before man and God, resolute as they exchanged their rings. She reminded him just as he is always by her side, she would always be by his. This was their promise to be together forever. Now pronounced husband and wife, they walked out hand in hand to the guests of their wedding. Rounds of applause filled the air as their guests wished them a happiness filled life. Now a married woman and back in the changing room, Eliza asked the door and let her hair down. It was bound to draw attention when they call her, but that was the aim. It was a good diversion from the fact that nobody from the cuckoo's household showed up for the wedding. She walked into the reception hand in hand with Ren and they proceeded to offer their greetings to the Emperor, who looked proud of his matchmaking skills after seeing how beautifully they sparkled. And who raised the toast to the Winter Knights who had continued to protect him and for generations on end? Aww, she's a Winter Knight now. Music filled the banquet hall and they danced. Oh, they danced. As they swayed beautifully to the music, few could keep their eyes off them. Contrary to what they had expected, she was graceful and beautiful. Red hair that was considered unlucky looked silkily breathtaking on her. At the end of the dance, the newlyweds parted to perform their duties to high society. Ren promised to come running if she called. Eliza, now alone, visually scouted the banquet hall as they spotted the table of the most important members of high society. Thankfully, the two women who have sense are included. She walked up to them to strike a conversation. The beautiful blonde one was Louisa and the other two were Cecilia and Raella. She had heard rumors of the beauty of northern women. The rumors had not done them justice though. They sat together and discussed politics. Louisa brought up the Delphinium of the South that had abolished the class system. Both commoners and aristocrats had come together to overthrow the system. Eliza partially disagreed with her point of view. Contrary to the view that her class system had been abolished, it would have been more appropriate to say it had been strengthened. Class was no longer determined by status, but rather by wealth. So the wealthy had taken the position of aristocrats, which further widened the gap between the rich and the poor capital. How does it to think? Louisa figured that trend might have affected rebellion, which was also in the South. Eliza thought back to her argument with her sister and could not help but agree. The North didn't have such problems because they considered noblesse obliged to be of great importance. So the commoners had no complaints and willingly accepted the royal family. Eliza believed the situation in the South had improved they adopted the same culture and they, as the liaisons between the North and the South, had a crucial role to play in that regard. Her response was the result of one of the critical thinking, and the ladies took a shine to her. The conversation was the birth of a beautiful friendship. Ren, who looked out for her from afar, was satisfied to see she was blending in just fine. Ren and Eliza collapsed in their carriage, but sighed in exhaustion. What is this match made in heaven? That much social interaction had drained the lives out of them both. When Eliza yawned, Ren offered up his shoulder as a pillow. She laid her head on him, drifting off to sleep, only waking up later in her own bed with a tray of food Ren had personally brought for her to eat when she woke up. It wasn't like her to let her guard down like that. Now she was headed for their bedroom, the room they were to spend their first night in. When she walked into the room, Ren, who had been staring out the window, turned towards her, quickly closing the distance. They had a duty to fulfill. They sat distance from each other, and when Ren made a move, Eliza visibly flinched. She might have readied herself for most of what marriage had to offer, but I guess not this part. Ren assured her they didn't have to if she wasn't ready. It might have been their duty, but her comfort reigned supreme over anything else. That night, they lay side by side in bed, Elizabeth already fast asleep and Ren gently keeping her safe and warm. The next day, Eliza was to receive the oaths of the Black Knights. Ren ordered the White Knights be kept at the drill hall until afternoon. They were a tiny bit unruly and not his first choice for who she should meet. Luan's grandson Yule, a butler in training, was to escort Eliza to the grounds to receive their oaths. 
As they walked, he explained the white knights protect the land of Winter Knights and go on the Winter Expedition, while the black knights provide general security services ensuring the day-to-day -day security of the castle. She was heading to have the black knights swear allegiance to her, but she had to do it alone. Proof she was a strong, independent woman. A tradition she found interesting. Yul, who was supposed to be escorting her, lost his way, but was rather quick to mask it, hoping and praying to the girls that the direction he sent her through indeed led to the black knights and not the white knights instead. At the white knight's training ground, the burly knight hit through a pile of wood with his hand coated in magic. He was energetically on his way to set a new record for himself. Although he was supposedly the most skilled in the other, one could argue Bluebell the knight that had saved Elena was more skilled than him. The comparison was not welcomed by Elena. Being compared to him was an unsettling thought. Her comment ticked him off and he was ready for a match. Let's fight fair and square now. She reminded him that she had won every previous battle and this wasn't going to be any different. A true man does not back down is usually the motto of such well-built men. She unwillingly accepted his challenge. Putting his fist in magic, he moved to deliver a punch. One day Elena easily sidestepped. Before he could throw his second fist, she grabbed him by the hair, giving him a thrashing. The other members of the order didn't interfere. It wasn't like it was the first or last time. A knight came running, bringing news that the Duchess was on her way, causing silence to descend on the training grounds. Captain of the knights assured him he was mistaken. Her appointment was the Black Knight, only to be proven wrong not long after when Eliza walked into the training ground introducing herself and asserting she was yet to receive their oaths of allegiance. All ye knights swear loyalty to me. Usually those blessed with winter magic powers could instinctively tell the true nature of anyone they came in contact with, unless the person possesses the power of her under magic. As the Duchess stood before them, the knights couldn't get rid of her at all. Eliza apologized, for it appeared she had come to the wrong place. But the captain, Lexamere, did not believe in coincidences. The white knights gave no second chances. She would have to end their allegiance there and then. The air grew thick after what he said. The knights thought their captain was being too hard on the duchess. They did not seem to expect much in terms of strength from her. Eliza had no problem taking the test immediately, though. Bring it on, bitches. You're underestimating the hell out of me. The surprise at her response was even more proof the children did not read her. The audacity. Just as Lecter tried to decide on what to test the duchess on, Two knights brought their way through the walls of the building close by. Yet another common occurrence around the air from the way the knights reacted. Becca gave her the task of separating their fight to prove her worthiness. A task she accepted with a smile. She walked a distance away from the knights and grasped in their fighting as everyone else looked on. What was her plan? Elena figured she was about to do something reckless again like she did in the marketplace. Eliza, looking down on them, raised their hands, releasing waves of red currents into the ground. Her destructive magic caused the air to split open effectively and in the fight between them. They looked horrified, remaining small for them to lose one tiny body part. After using destructive magic like that, she smiled, telling them unnecessary fight and never did anyone any good. <laughs> yes, ma'am. We no fight again. She had shut up all the adult in mouths and the knights looked at her in awe. Following their captain's lead, the knights knelt, heads bowed and swore their allegiance to the Duchess. Yes. Remember your place and never speak to me anyhow again. Back at the residence, Luan dragged Yul to render apologies for mishandling his job. Eliza saw no need to hold him readily responsible. Things had worked out fine regardless. While there, Elena ran up to Eliza almost out of breath. She apologized for her behavior at the marketplace. She had acted with insolence. They had not known each other at the time, so she was pardoned. However, Elena wanted one more thing. She wished to become Eliza's own knight. She wished to pledge her loyalty to her. At the marketplace, she had judged Eliza based on her narrow views. She wanted a chance to serve her now. Eliza declined on the spot, though. She did not dislike Elena, but she had no trust in knights, so she'd rather keep one by her side. Elena stood by the split earth the Duchess had left on their training grounds, deep in thought. If the problem was that she was a knight, then that meant all she had to do was look for another way to serve the Duchess. She held on to their brilliant idea and walked up to her captain, requesting leave until the start of winter. You go, girl. You want something? You fight for it. At dinner, Eliza gleefully recounted the details of her day to Ren. He asked if the white knights had been rude to her, but she had seen them as a more energetic and capable bunch. Although he had believed she would be fine, he could not help but ask if she had been hurt anywhere. Him worrying about her was yet another form of warmth she welcomed, although unfamiliar. The dining was bustling with favorable emotions that the maid silently but happily hummed to as they hurried around with their duties. With such good feelings, it would have been a pity to end the night so early. So Ren suggested they go on a walk in the garden under the moonlight. <laughs> Eliza was more than happy to. As they walked the garden path, she was drawn to the beautiful winter days that sparkled almost like snow. As she admired the flowers, Ren told her the origin of its name. It was named after a young girl who protected winter nights from the cruel goddess of winter. Long ago, when the goddess of winter blew a gust of wind, causing the winter season to drag on for years, leading to several deaths, 
A young girl appeared before the goddess to plead for mercy. The goddess decided to bury the whole of winter in her heart. If she could endure it for two months, the problem would be solved. But if she gave up before then, winter would plague winter night forever. The girl accepted the terms, fighting the cold in her heart as she traveled back to the village. Upon her arrival, the villagers blamed her for the never-ending cold. Oh, you human beings. She had become an outcast. At the end of the two months, she passed on and winter came to an end. The long winter ended and small white flowers began to sprout. It was then the villagers realized that she had saved them from certain death. But if that's the case, shouldn't they have named the flowers after her, not the days they spent dying in winter? Anyways, Eliza admired the flowers. After listening to the story, she reached out her hand to stroke them. The origin was both beautiful and sad. The tale of Winter Day was a famous story. Grant's mother had read it to him when he was young. After hearing that, Eliza was suddenly curious about his family. His mother was from a small town and studied archaeology. She had become the Duchess of Winter Night to study the land. Eliza saw this as proof of her love for the land. When Ren asked about her parents, she thought of her family happily together, but she was absent from those memories. She always had been. But she couldn't bring herself to tell Ren that. So instead, she told him they were wise folks. It was, after all, their decision to send her to Winter Night. And nobody could say it was a bad decision, to be very honest. It was getting a little windy now. Covering her up with her shawl, Ren suggested the end the night there. He didn't want her catching a cold. The next day at the office of the White Knights, the Knights bet on the reason Elena was taking a break. Their guesses ranged from her suffering from an unrequited love to having a boyfriend to suffering from gambling and drinking. When Elena barged into the room, the burly guy abandoned the bets and asked straight from the source. Such a straightforward human being. Not that she was going to give them the satisfaction of actually answering their questions. She ignored him and headed straight for their superior. They wouldn't stop pestering her, which only ticked her off even more. She had come to finish the paperwork for her leave. On her way to submit her documents to the head butler, she wondered why Elena disliked Knight so. She overheard the maids talking about the candidate for the Art Duchess's personal maid. So far, none had passed, even though it was a well envied position. Elena saw her opportunity to get to stay by the Duchess's side at all times. Fan behavior at its peak. In Eliza's office, Luan reported on the progress of their search for a noble maid. One had finally been decided upon. Now that got her attention. She raised her head and in walked the blue bell. Lena, at your service, my lady. Days later, Eliza woke up next to Ren from a nightmare. She had dreamt of an incident that had taken place during her childhood. It was her first time having a personal night. He protected her when other knights spoke badly of her. He was a gentleman, attentive to her needs. She appreciated his efforts and bought a gift to show him that. She had been so excited to give it to him at night only for her to hear him tell his colleagues that he considered her easy to win over. Her type was easy after all, they were starved for attention. They'll take whatever crumbs of affection you left out for them. He hated having to be nice to her just because it was an easy way to get a promotion. A young Eliza had lost her trust in nights from there on. She had been deep in thought about the dream and absently stared at Ren when he asked if she was okay. Her blank face worried him. She put his worries to rest though. She was not ready to share her fears with him. It was time for Eliza to start her archduchess duties. She let herself relax for a few days and was looking forward to working. Repent. Resting is not a crime. He had heard Dame Bluebell was to be her personal maid going forward, but Eliza wondered if it was okay to use the White Knight's resources in that manner. Ren assumed there wouldn't be any problems because the dame had followed all the required processes. Hearing that made Eliza sigh, giving Ren the impression that she was less than satisfied with Elena as her maid, which she tried to deny. Ren assured her that Bluebell had a sincere heart and for whatever reason she was completely in love with her. She didn't need to feel too pressured and she would be of much help to her. When Eliza got to her office, a shiny Elena was waiting for her. Eliza was curious as to how Elena got the position, and Elena proudly told her she had applied and gotten in. I've left no stone unturned, ma'am. I will serve you with my life. As Eliza worked, Elena stood, unmoving, watching her with reverence. Her gaze, filled with admiration, felt more like invisible pressure weighing severely on her shoulders. To get her to at least move away for a bit, Eliza asked for some tea. It was delicious tea that eased the pressure on her shoulders just a little bit, and she was able to go back to work. But that relief could only last for so long. Elena wasn't moving, declining the need for a break. Eliza decided to send her off with documents for the butler, and an excited Elena ran out of the room. She seemed so pure and chirpy. Not a combination Eliza was used to. Dealing with her for a couple of hours was equivalent to working a full day. Eliza was exhausted. On the other side of the door, Elena was ecstatic, having received her first task. She zoomed through the halls with precision and determination to accomplish a task of delivering documents to perfection, ignoring everything in her way. A colleague who had seen her in that rush went reporting to the rest of the White Knights. Now, who wouldn't want to see the usually ill-tempered Elena in the maid dress going above and beyond to be acknowledged by somebody else? While Eliza worked and Elena stared, 
The knight sent another representative to confirm the truth and inform the duchess of the future arrival of her maids. Hearing the knock at the door, Lina goes to open it, warning her colleague to keep his mouth shut if he still wanted to leave. The rattling of the carriages outside alerted Liza to the arrival of more visitors, something that had been happening quite frequently in recent days. Elena explained that winter was coming. In preparation for the expedition into the winter forest to put an end to winter, the white knights were beginning to stock up on supplies. Before she could go on further to elaborate, her colleague interjects requesting Eliza visit the white knights again, his excuse being that Ren was at the office of the white knights and it would be an opportunity to discuss the expedition in detail. Elena tried her best to prevent Eliza from leaving. She could sniff his ulterior motives from a mile away. He just wanted everyone to see her handmade costume. It's not like much has been going her way lately, so she probably should have guessed Eliza was going to agree to go regardless, leaving it stressed Elena to anticipate the future. At the office, the black and white knights standing before Ren bickered playfully. The white knights exist for the sake of putting an end to winter, while the black knights do every other job a knight should do. And they never forgot to rub their faces of the rather thick-skinned white knights who considered their babbling the buzzing of flies. Ouch! Ren about had it with their commentary and asked them to compete by finding out who could carry more firewood without carriage. Put that energy into being productive, you old men. That shut them up, and it was kinda cute to see. His not-so-subtle smile was proof he was having a slightly more entertaining life than before the Archduchess, and his knights picked up on that. While some had the tact to not be straightforward, some didn't, handing him a boink on his head. A well-deserved one, too. This bustling scene of comedy was what Elizabeth walked in to see. Most of them were than happy to see the food, but Ren was ecstatic. The chance to have some lady time in between work talk must have sounded like heaven to him. While the knights took a break munching on the snacks, and Lena had a nightmare come true in front of her colleagues teasing her, Ren and Liza sat alone discussing the expedition. Winter in Amalilith was more than a season. It was an entity of its own that had to be put to an end in order to move on to the next season. Something winter magic only manifested by the head of the Winter Knight's household was necessary for. The White Knights awakened their own winter magic by swearing allegiance to the head of the household. But wouldn't that mean Elena doesn't have winter magic? And she still sweeps the floor with the White Knights? Damn. Ren was going to be joining the expedition as usual because here we lead by example. Eliza reached to hold his hands, pleading that he safely return. He's been doing that all along, dear. Don't leave me a widow when I just got married. As they prepared for the expedition, in a cave dripping ice with minions on one knee, their worst foe, Arundel, prepared for the upcoming battle. Consequences of work, Ren could not go with Eliza to interview the candidates for the position of head maid. Why couldn't he just do it in the winter as they do? Eliza could see his reluctance to let her go and promise she would be fine. She was taking a couple nights with her and if he came down to it, she could protect herself as the boss she is. But Ren just wanted to spend more time with his wife. Poor you. You shouldn't have said you have no love to offer. You seem to have an overabundance of it. As Ren walked off to work, Elena opted to get a thicker coat for Eliza. It was cooled her out. The other maid observed Elena's care, recalling how she had heard and cautioned the group of gossiping maids speaking ill about Eliza earlier, swearing to make their life hell they so much as dared to utter words against her boss and theirs, by the way, again. The look she had on her face as she pondered alerted Eliza. When Eliza prompted her to speak, she explained. Having Dame Bluebell a member of the second strongest family after the Winter Knights, who had refused to serve anyone until now, serve her with such dedication was strange, but interesting. With Elena's arrival, they headed out to begin their journey. During the ride, Eliza thought the frequent patrols Ren was doing was a consequence of something she wasn't aware of, and so she asked Elena, who explained that since the wedding, they had detected activity from Arundel, weirdos that worship winter and can be considered Winter Knights' worst enemy, a sneaky and persistent bunch. They were the reason they were particular about information from the family leaking out and why they were going all the way to the harbour to interview head made candidates as opposed to doing it in the Winter Night Mansion. Well, that explains that. Elena saw Eliza ponder on the information she had just been served, and in order to dissuade her worries, promised Ren would be fine. He could sweep the floor with the entirety of the White Knights and still have enough strength to do it a couple more times. His safety was not something they had to worry about. That was reassuring for Eliza. But Elena didn't stop there. Looking at the woman she had sworn to herself to serve with all her heart, she promised that she would protect her at all costs. Elena was being sincere, but some scars don't heal that easily, and Eliza told her that. There had been a time she had thought knights to be the most powerful and honorable people in the world, but before being knights, they were humans. Even though it was their promise to do so, their swords were unable to protect their masters, and their words cut deeper than swords. That's why she doesn't trust knights. Words weren't going to be enough to appeal to Eliza, and Elena could see that. Knights speak with their swords and she promised to convey her inner feelings and in her trust one sword fight at a time, protecting her. Her sincerity must have started to cause a crack in her titanium resolve because Eliza promised to try. 
try her best to give her a chance. And that's on what progress. Good for you. Only took you about two months. The trust issues must not have been as deep as some of ours. Arriving at the destination, they were met with two of the three headmaid candidates, Beth and Ira. The last candidate had gone missing. She had certainly boarded the ship, but nobody could account for her whereabouts after that. The test had begun. Elizabeth asked the candidates their opinion on the matter. Beth figured that she head over to the harbor to look for her. Her disappearance might be proof someone was trying to harm the Winter Night family. But if that's the case, wouldn't it be better to run? I'd be, y'all don't practice safety first. Ira was more of a preserve your life kind of person. My kind of girl. You like life, as you should. Her reluctance to venture into danger led to her being chastised for doubting Elizabeth's abilities. No. She just doesn't want to miss two. Your insistence as a supposed maid to head into danger with your two kurukuru eyes is what I consider sus. To Elena's dismay, Elizabeth decided to head to the harbour, as Beth had suggested. Someone on their way to see her had gone missing. It was her duty to get to the bottom of it. It's my duty to see danger and run into it headfirst. Miss me with that, please. But Eliza had already begun to suspect something was amiss. As they headed out, she reminded Lena to be on guard, and off to the harbour they went. As they walked to the streets of the harbour, Beth, stopping at an alleyway, called out to Elizabeth just before running in. Ignoring both Elizabeth and the night shouts for her to think first before acting, seconds later filling the harbour with her screams. Meanwhile, Ren and the White Knights had just finished exterminating some remnants of Arundel. Ren thought it was too easy. Compared to their usual sneakiness and their insistence on the low profile, this extermination was way too easy. The suspicions were confirmed by the tattling of an almost dead man promising that even though it seemed like he had won, he would receive a gift of blood from Arundel. There was only one person whose blood would have driven him mad, Eliza. He ran out, leaving the knights behind, galloping at top speed to look for his wife. At the alleyway Beth had run into, the knights could feel the energy of Arundel sipping out. They wanted Elizabeth to head back with Elena while they attempted to sort out the situation themselves, but she wasn't budging. She wouldn't abandon her men. Before any could leave to inform the archduke of the situation, Jack, who had been the fastest and best for the job, was weeks away leg first into the embrace of Beth, who looked possessed by magic and was surrounded by quite a number of ominous looking minions in black coats. Her new look wasn't surprising to Elizabeth, contrary to what Beth was expected and hoped for. The decision to follow Beth was based on the premise that she was a fraud in some way. Her acting was suspicious from start to finish. Her target was Elizabeth. By virtue of being a winter knight, she was already a hindrance to their plans. They planned to freeze the earth over. Nobody told me building snowmen out of literal human beings was also acceptable art. Beth continued to crazy ramble. If not for the winter nights, the world would have been beautifully frozen. Now that the propaganda was over, Beth sent forth her minions to exterminate them all. The knights rushed into battle with Elena cutting anything that dared to come near her liege. Elizabeth putting a protective barrier around her and Ira sent Elena off to fight with the other knights despite Elena wanting to stick to her duty of protecting her. She was not a weakling and would not keep her ear while the other knights fought. With that, Elena seriously got to work. While the knights fought at the forefront, Elizabeth protected them from behind. Oh, she looks good. Her display of power was maddening for Beth. The monstrous Archduke sure had found his perfect match. Ren, who had rushed over to where Elizabeth was supposed to be, was at a loss when he found she had gone to the harbour. She was around those targets and he had no way to find out where the hell she was. At least he didn't until he noticed the frozen snow particles that seemed to be a deliberate trail to be followed. The knights had done their best exterminating the minions Beth had gathered, but despite having lost them all, Beth remained calm, an ominous result in Elizabeth's eyes. Beth, now alone, was excited to show off winter, to show off the magic her master had given. She swallowed up the life force of her minions, increasing her powers exponentially before going in for the kill. Elizabeth tried to protect her people with a barrier, but that wasn't enough this time. The tales of Beth's power broke through the defense, strangling one of the knights, freezing him up bit by bit. They continued to fight, slashing while trying not to be frozen. Elena, unfortunately, couldn't keep up. Without winter magic, she was no match for this level of Arundel's power. With her sword broken, she was on the verge of being devoured, but was saved in the nick of time by Elizabeth. But that might have been Beth's plan, because in that moment, Beth directed her magic right through Elizabeth's heart, sending chills through her whole body. Beth had gotten what she wanted and Elizabeth was fading quick. Before losing consciousness, the last image in her mind was Ryan's smiling face. She staggered, losing consciousness and falling to the ground. Before she hits the ground, in came potent winter magic slashing through Arundel's magic. Ren, holding the now freezing Elizabeth in his arms, apologized for being late. Leaving Elizabeth in Ira's care, he walked into the battlefield. The look of anger and absolute hatred on his face was much for Beth to handle and sent her into overdrive. She plunged for Ren with all she had, but she was out of her depth. He dashed, slashing forward through her magic and her. 
Before him, she was going to wither away. In a last ditch effort, she began to sound incantations, dragging the now lifeless bodies of her comrades to surround Ren. A futile effort with the way he slashed through that ruckus. They don't call you the monster of the north for nothing. She could see her impending death before her. As she cried out in hopes of coming to an agreement, he mercilessly cut her down. It was finally over. Ren called for the knights to get a warp gate ready, and he carried his now unconscious wife heading away from the stench of blood and a dejected Elena for their home. And that brings us to the end of this episode. If you liked it, please do not forget to subscribe and I shall see you later. Thank you.